Hello everyone, so I will be kind of leading this Q&A panel today. Um, my name is Noah Leibson, I'm the curator of exhibits at the International Museum of the Horse. Um, so after this talk today, if you so desire, you can go down to the museum and see our brand new Archangelo, Horsology, and Tanucci case and see some of his things from the Belmont and the Traverse case, which he just won pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> a few days before that, uh, Tiana here, who does, you know, the media and marketing for them, she texted me, she's like, you have to update the case once he wins the Traverse. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will, I will, I will do so. Um, and what do you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, we have the video, we kind of did the introduction here, but if you guys want to introduce yourselves. Hi. <laughs> Hi everybody, thank you all so much for coming out today to hear a little bit about what we do. And I know you guys are probably tired of hearing all about what I do, so I'm not a good eye person, but um, thrilled to be here and thank you for all you guys have done, Noah and team, for hosting us out here today and obviously in the museum, which is pretty cool, if I'm being really honest. But, um, looking forward to answering or telling you anything that we can about what we do and you know me on the racing side, so I'll hand off to Katie for the farm side. Hi, everyone. So this is a really full circle moment for me. I've been at this horse park most of my life. Mm -hmm. So um, very excited to be here to talk to you all, answer any questions, um, and just give you a little insight of everything that we do at the farm makes everything we do at the track possible. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I'm trying my best. Um, so, well, actually, for you know my first line of questioning, um, I've been told you two have known each other for several years, so just wanted to see how you guys ended up getting together and actually going into business together. I could do this one. Where's mom? It's actually Katie's mom's fault. She's sitting right there in the second row. Um, I, as as most know, grew up riding, showing, and when I had moved up to Marion County, which is obviously where Ocala is, was still doing a lot of work showing, and Katie was a little bit younger. Not we all were. Not much shorter, same height, just younger. And um, you, you don't remember this as much, but I would help do like the equitation classes and like do little special little like tests for the junior riders at the time and whatnot, and got to know Katie and her family back then. Um, and then Katie went off to college to become even more smart. And um, I ended up training horses out of her parents' training center when I first started training thoroughbreds. And then just more full circle moments, um, Katie decided she needed to go into thoroughbred training after being very smart in college. Seriously, she's really smart. And, um, and just how life evolved and actually COVID happening and everything else we took all of our, what we knew and were really good at and just put it under one umbrella, and here we are. All right. Well, that actually leads very well into what, yes, thank you, you're good at this. Um, so both of you actually do have a background in, you know, hunter, jumper, riding, off-track thoroughbreds before you got into racing. So I think a lot of people are curious how you end up, like what motivated you to go from that world to this world and how those past experiences might actually inform you as racehorse trainers now. So <laughs> it's not the like cute, everything I always dreamed of story that you're thinking. Um, so I did grow up traveling around the country with my mom, hunter jumpers, I was the pony kid. And my dad, um, who's actually a jockey before I was ever thought of, um, trained thoroughbreds for as long as I can remember. My mom, my sister, and I did a lot of the off-the-track courses at that point in time. I never had an interest in the racetrack side of it. I loved the off-the-track thoroughbreds. I loved, you know, giving them a second shot. And then after college, um, I have done enough thoroughbred, you know, retraining. And after college, I was working for my dad in the barn while I was doing my master's degree at the University of Florida. And it came to a point where my dad said, Katie, you're gonna have to get on these babies. <coughs> and so I said, that's great, but 
but I want to be able to, you know, do what I want and and be able to teach them how I want to teach them. So it's going to make it easier for everybody on the on the backside when those horses get to go have their second career. And he obviously didn't care. <laughs> and so that turned into you know being a little bit more involved in the young horses and. And I think not, and not to speak for Jenna, but we've um, answered this question enough that we have very similar outlooks on it. That seeing seeing that click with the young horses um, when you're teaching them is such a fulfilling moment. And being able to know that those horses are going to go on and do the best that they can at the racetrack, and then they're set up properly for a second career is is really important to us. And so that is what we've carried forward into our young horses and into into our program. Um, so it was a little bit of a whirlwind for me. It wasn't exactly um, what I chose. It, it chose me and she, <laughs> unfortunately, fortunately, um, we have a little bit of the same story in that aspect. So love what we do, love dealing with the young horses. Um, and then all of our, our show horse background, um, I think just gives us a bit of a different perspective of some of the rehabs that we do. And so it's all it's all kind of come full circle. Just to top that off, I think the biggest motivation for both of us is the idea. Why oh, emotional? <laughs> 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 Get together, girl. Um, it's it's the idea that like people ask, why why did you want to get into the thoroughbred? I did not. Like he did not like. My first exposure to them, I was probably around 10 years old, and I was horrified, I was horrified by what I saw, the energy, it just seemed so aggressive, and just all of that was just, it wasn't anything that a 10-year-old child, you know, we sensationalized when we were little, and it was like, oh my God, it's terrible. And so I think the motivation becomes, well, if I can do the best that I can with what comes through my hands, then I feel like I'm doing my part. And I think we both feel that way from, when we get to full mares all the way through breaking and training and developing and racing and retirement that we can't save them all. And that's a commitment that is way past our scope as human beings. But if we can do the absolute best with what we can that comes through our hands, no matter what stage. And so we get to do a lot of fun stuff with sending horses back to other trainers as well from the farm side or sending young horses on to trainers that we get to develop. So knowing that we have imprinted the very beginning to our best of ability and understanding who those horses are, that's what we can contribute to proper stewardship of these horses throughout their careers. Amazing. <laughs> well, and from what I gather, you actually are, you know, still super involved with that you have Encore, is it? So your own retired program, could you kind of talk about that and what you do with these thoroughbreds in their second careers? Do you do all that yourselves? Because we have so much time on our hands. <laughs> <laughs> we are buttons for hundred 100% of the time. So it's something that Jen and I obviously have always been passionate about, the second career, and whether that means a, a pasture pet or you know a, a three-day World Equestrian Games horse, um, whatever that means. The horses have given us so much, and and we just feel it's it, it's they deserve us to give back to them. And so, the farm that we train out of in Ocala, Goldmark Farm, is set up beautifully and allows us the space um, to actually start the it's horseology encore that we did. And it is not necessarily just thoroughbreds. Um, it is open, you know, up to all equines, um, but it is something that we're very passionate about. We have rehomed a couple that have just come back through, you know, our our training program, and owners say, you know what, I think I think this horse has done everything for me, and let's try and and get a second career now. So we have done that um, in the few years that we've been working together. We have a couple of you know old broodmares. We have a field that we call our oldies. And so they will they will get to live out their lives with us, and we will you know steward them to the best of our ability. Um, but it is something we we are passionate about, and and with our connections throughout the hunter jumper world and just the sport horse world, it allows us to to have a little bit of a further reach with them as well. Uh, 
side note, Dr. J. Deb, who was my first greatest take winner, he's kind of like the story of thoroughbred. He went from an eight claimer to a grade three winner. Um, so he's retired with us. He will live out his entire life with us. Can you get, try to retrain him? He said, no, I'm done. <laughs> like, I'm going to be, you know, he's, he's our harem boss. He gets to live out with all the old ladies who are retired. They're all his gals. And so he has his gals, and, and, and he's the quirkiest, coolest horse. Very ter territorial, that's fair. Um, but he gets to, uh, he'll be with us forever, and um, that's part of what Encore was for us. Good for him. Good for him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, kind of actually diving next into the racing world, um, yeah. the first career before the second career. Um, so together, you guys formed Horseology, and everyone says, you know, it's, it's actually pretty different because you do everything in-house. So if you want to kind of elaborate on, you know, what sets yourselves apart from the rest of the industry <laughs> and what you do. So our industry has um, a wrap not always a good one for being very um, splintered, where you go here for this, you go here for that, you go here for there. And so with Katie and I having, it's similar with the first background, um, Katie leaned more into the sales um, side of things, and I was more into the you know, breeding, and she loves bully mares, it's her favorite thing to do. <laughs> and so uh, we took all of our services that we knew um, and we were good at, and said, why don't we offer to our people that we know already and our clients, basically one spot. So under our umbrella, we like to say it's from conception to retirement. So this way, you know, we have a rapport with people, they're comfortable with what we do, they understand they're gonna get all that we do. Um, and so that's how it all happened, where we brought everything under one umbrella and it allowed us to carry each stage through. And it wasn't that, well, if it comes to us, it's never leaving us. It was a, wherever their exit point was, if they were breeding to go to the sales ring or breeding to go to race, we wanted to help steward owners and help them make the best decisions with the, the type of horses they had, quality, place them appropriately, and help them steward their time through the industry as responsibly as possible. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> um, and so, of course, you are in town for the Keeneland sales. Um, very busy time for horse people. Um, so, we've also seen you being super involved in the buying and selling aspect. So, could you talk about some of that? Um, I know a term that comes up a lot is pin hooking as a service offered. So, if you kind of want to explain how that works. Katie. Okay. Yeah, so the, the clock is, is um, ticking as there are horses selling today, so we are trying to buy. So, <laughs> no pressure. Um, so pin hooking has been around for you know quite some time. It is just you know it's been another vein of the thoroughbred industry. Uh, I think that people are leaning on a little bit more and more as the years you know progress, and so basically. It is, you know, buying, we buy something as a, as a weanling or as a yearling, and then we sell it in the next eight to 10 months. We buy something as a weanling, we'll turn around and sell it as a yearling. Buy something as a yearling, we take it to a two-year-old sale, sell it as a two-year-old. So a pretty, pretty simple process that is the most stressful you can imagine. And so it's something that we like to allow our clients, and, and in the video you saw, you know, trying to bring in new people where racing has always been this extravagant, you know, end goal for people that, you know, watch their bread racing. And this is allowing people to get a, a tiny step in, you know, get dip their toe in the water when it comes to being within the thoroughbred industry. So, you know, it's something that has an end goal. It's something, you know, that is still an experience, has a bit of a profit, you know, margin that we're hoping for, obviously. But I think it's it's just allowing new people in and then, you know, they get kind of, usually get the bug and then move on to, you know, kind of the racing side of it. It gives people an exposure to the thoroughbred industry. Um, you know, everyone wants to look at the thoroughbred industry as a business. And there is, a, you know, we have the emotional part pretty locked up. Um, so in the balance of trying to find the business side of it with the emotional side of it, it does offer that opportunity for people where sometimes racing has a harder, steeper curve on profitability, where pin hooking um, tends to offer a little bit easier of a point of view. Awesome. So I'm actually going to bring up a quote that you said on the show. 
No, it's a good one. It's a good one. <laughs> we put it in the museum. <laughs> um, but if you can't find a seat at the table, make your own table. First of all, I think that's something that every single person can really resonate with in a different way. Um, but I wondered if you might kind of elaborate on that and some of the challenges you might have faced and I guess advice that you have for those new people who are trying to break into the industry or just want to be passionate. Someone was trying to poach our quote the other day. I got to tell Tiana about that. <laughs> it wasn't exact, so. Um, so being very honest, the quote, um, I didn't pre-think it. Um, I'm, as I said, famously, I'm not that smart, pretty smart, but not that smart to load pre-hand. Um, it was the politest, do we have kids here? <laughs> it was the politest version of um, FU that I could give in that moment. <laughs> life, and this isn't just an industry um, comment, this is a life comment, you know, you get told no a lot. And so, in this industry, it's no different. Huh? And it's not necessarily a gender thing, it's just, uh, you're not ready yet, or we don't think, or we don't see you for how you see yourself. And so I have said a lot, it's a lot of times, it's a they problem, not a you problem. And so, that was my, you know, very polite, you know, we did this. We built this from, from the ground up. Um, and, there were many of the opportunities that I wanted or yearned for or asked for or hey, let me try with one and told no, told no, told no. And those no's help grow you. And for me, they're motivation and they push you. Um, and it's not always just to prove them wrong, and, but it's being careful not to allow their no's to affect your self-worth and your value as a human. And so the quote is about putting people around you that are like-minded with what the goal is and how they want to treat the process and the horse. Um, it's also important not to surround yourself with yes people. And so Katie and I, we have very similar points of view, but we have very unique opinions. Fiona, strong ones. Strong ones. Strong ones. Yes. Irish, Puerto Rican, <laughs> promise they're strong. <laughs> um, and Fiona, my assistant, is very Irish, who also has a very strong opinion, <laughs> which I love. Um, and so that's important, and it, it's important in building a team um, that is balanced and fair and offers different points of view um, on horses and you know, the well-being of those things. So that is the honest motivation behind the quote. Um, and my brain was going a million miles an hour as the camera was up our nostrils and the microphone was in our face. Uh, just so grateful for the team that we have built over the last few years um, and where it's going, what we're producing, which is past Archangelo, which has been a lot of cool horses we've been able to watch go on to other trainers and be successful. So when I say that I didn't want to um, come into the thoroughbred industry, um, and then I decided, hey, guess what? I'm going to do this. Um, my parents have always been very supportive. Uh, my dad said, you don't have to. You, know, you absolutely don't have to. It's not easy. And my parents have had a, you know, have had their training business. I grew up watching them, you know, own a small business and run a small business, and it's never been easy. But, you know, obviously I'm very lucky to, you know, have made the connection with Jenna and I have very luckily been able to skip over some of those um, hard no's because I have had a very good seat at a very good table. So it is, it has been, it's, it's been a pleasure, but it's, it is um, a very hard industry, which I'm, I'm thankful for, you know, the people that have been before me that have, that have just, Made their, made their own tables. So you kind of started to touch on this, Katie, but I wondered um, who <laughs> some of the influences were on your career that really were positive ones who helped cultivate you know, that for you and, and people you might have been inspired by in training, but also in life. So Katie and I talked a lot about this after the Belmont, I believe, because everyone really focused on the Belmont win as the women card. And um, as I said, I'm not very woman forward in the sense of I want opportunity because of my gender. I want opportunity because I bust my butt. And we do a hell of a job. And so, you know, with that, <laughs> with that, I think it's it's just really important to stay focused on the quality work you're doing and, and the job that you're doing. And um, I think a lot of what we've done has been just because we've been honest and transparent and forthcoming with people and, and growing all of that. And so um, we talk a lot after the Belmont because I, 
not have a, they're not a moron. Sometimes I can get a little dense or thick or stubborn, but I didn't quite understand the point of view. I understood the gender aspect of it. I understood the why, the what, but it didn't resonate in a way that has meant to other people. And I think part of that was when I started writing at three-ish, I know, unhealthy. My hands are crooked because of it, I'm sure. Um, they, all of my trainers growing up were all women. They weren't thoroughbred trainers, but all of my trainers growing up were all women. They were strong women, they were in their own business, they dealt with us bratty, dirty-footed kids jumping jumps around the barn and being barn brats and all of that. But it was never, it never looked at growing up, you know, through the 80s and 90s and 2000s and, and in the, the show horse world, so many of the trainers were all women at the top of the game. You know, so many grand free riders now women. And so for me, I just never had that point of view of you can't or you shouldn't because you're, you know, a woman or a dude. That, that was absurd to me. So I think a lot of my influence, honestly, was outside of the thoroughbred world because it was just the norm. And so it never resonated to me of, oh, don't go to the racetrack because you're not a guy. Well, that's weird. Like, that's just, who does that? And so for me, I think that was the biggest reason. And it took Katie and I talking about it to try and put it together of the why or the how. and. Um, my probably thunk on the forehead is when I took my trainer's test and the after I passed my test, the male stewards, the stewards are who run racing, um, well, we're gonna pass you, but just don't effing embarrass us. <laughs> yes, sir. But I didn't know what it meant, right? Because I was like, well, that's just ridiculous because they did it in a little box to put me in. So it was a them problem. You know, I could read, I could write. I knew what I was testing, you know, so like, but they didn't, I wasn't an assistant for X person. I didn't, was not the racetrack for that guy. I didn't do this with that man. And the generation that they came from, and not to, you know, not to their fault, our entire industry had been so male driven that you had to come up under X, Y, Z for them to relate to you. So I appreciated their motivation as well. <laughs> well, on behalf of women, thank you. <laughs> um, and actually, uh, my next question I wanted to go to with raising a bit of a topic change, but I know that you both are super into equine health and also have that background with Katie, being very smart and having a master's degree. <laughs> um, and Jenna, you working as a vet assistant. Um, so do you want to kind of elaborate on what you brought with you from, you know, your backgrounds into this industry now? Katie was also a vet assistant for some time too, for best years in Kentucky. <laughs> Love the bluegrass. I'm only saying that because it's on the yet. <laughs> So I think it, um, I, mm, this is a hard one. So, so I did work as a um, vet tech in Ocala at a um, very renowned clinic. I also worked here in Lexington as a tech for a repro vet. Um, I worked for sport horse vets. And so seeing a lot, and then you, I think you just carry that forward and seeing things from different eyeballs. Um, when you are, I think a lot of people get stuck in a barn or seeing the same horse do the same thing every single day, it becomes, um, you get very full cup blinker with it and you know, in, in one way where I think, and, and it relates back to some of our, our sport horse background as well, is you know, just a broader perspective of, well, this might not be anything that we've seen in the third right industry before, but I remember this jumper, you know, 10 years ago that had this, and it might be just, you know, a little bit more of an unorthodox way to look at it. But I think that's what I've been able to carry forward in evaluating, whether it be a lameness or a cellulitis that we have no idea where the heck it came from. Um, you know, some of these things are things we see in older sport horses that we don't usually see them in, in young thoroughbreds. And that's the biggest gap between the sport horse world in the thoroughbred world, and it was something I struggled with a lot actually when I was working for my dad, is this, in the thoroughbred world, you get to see them you know, up until they're two, three, especially when you're at the farm and not really relating over to the racetrack, is you get to see them until they're two, three, and then you don't know what they're really you know, fully blossoming into when they're gonna be six, seven, that's when you see it on the backside of it in the second career, you know, in the, in the 
um, rehoming and, and retraining of those thoroughbreds. So I think it's just carrying all of that knowledge and, and understanding that, you know, we don't always, you know, what's the, what's the quote when you hear hooves, don't think zebras. Um, I think sometimes you have to think zebras yeah. when it comes down to it. And so I think that's what I've been able to, to carry forward into that. Um, and then really just being detail oriented and, and looking at, you know, where does it all start? I think you can put a bandaid on a lot of things, but what, what does it all start with? You know, the horse has to be happy from the inside out. Um, you know, nutrition is something we really harp on and make sure our program is, is in tip top shape in, in that aspect. Um, but I think it's just, you can't get to tunnel vision when you're thinking about medicine or, or any of that when it comes to the, to the horses because they don't read the textbooks and they don't they don't care what, what you think you know. Just when you think you've seen it all. <laughs> They're like, oh yeah, hold my beer. <laughs> um, I think too, in being able to be in so many different barns, um, working um, with a vet, you get to see their programs. And if you're a student of observation at all, you can see in their programs what works, what doesn't work, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And so I think that was probably the biggest takeaway for me was being able to watch some very exceptional horse people with their programs. And they may have been the biggest and fanciest, but to see what their fails were and to see where they fell short, but also to you know recognize what worked for them. And so I think it was very important for my growth to watch those programs with an eyes wide open of why it worked and why it didn't work for particular horses. Awesome. Well, of course, we also can't make it through a talk without bringing up Archangelo. But he kind of had a humble beginning. He sold for thirty-five thousand in the Keeneland sales of Richling, and if I remember correctly, was actually first purchased as a pin-hooking prospect, but ended up no, he wasn't. Someone else he bought that sale was. Okay, my mistake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just once. Just once. Oh gosh. Um, but he certainly started to come into his own, so I wondered what some of the first markers were for this greatness to shine through, and when you realized you had someone special. <laughs> I can show you. You want to take this one? I can do that. Um, so he, Archangel came to us when he was um, just turned two. He had started up in Pennsylvania with Clovis Crane for his first couple of months, and um, John Everett, his owner, always wanted to just take his time with his horse. Um, he had played around some breeding on some um, unbridled song lines previously and just really fell in love with the frame, understood how immature he was. He's a mid May fall. And so when we got him in the, in the winter time, he was very naughty. Very, very naughty. Um, and so at that time is when we had figured out that he had a high testicle. Um, which is the Ridgeling common. And so depending on how you want to define a Ridgeling, he no longer has that high testicle. He is a fully descended cult with one testicle. <laughs> but if you go to the jockey club, the, the, what we have learned through this process, and, ha and New York is the only place that does this, is if, you, if we had removed the testicle and it was descended, they would actually call him a cult. <laughs> but they call him a Ridgeling, even though he only has one testicle, because when we remove the testicle, it was not descended below the aguinal ring. So, there's your fun fact. You guys can do whatever you want with that. But <laughs> that's, the, that's the real version. And the reason we took the testicle out is while he didn't show any lameness or soreness, he was behavioral. It really bothered him. And he would do very naughty things of trying to find horses that he wasn't ready to breed yet. Um, whether it was through a fence or through whatever, and you know, just very naughty boy things. And so um, for him, in this situation, it did work, where removing that high testicle changed him and it allowed him to, you know, they talk, they scream, they yell, not necessarily vocally, but he was telling us, you know, that that testicle was really bugging him. And so by removing it, it, it changed his world and obviously ours. Um, so we can have a more conversation about a testicle conversation. <laughs> Anyways, sorry, I digress. Um, and so our focus was again to always develop him slowly. Um, Mr. Everett's goal was for 2024 Breeders' Cup. 
And I said, that's cute, we have a whole year. <laughs> what are we gonna do with that? <laughs> Knowing that this horse was very forwardly training and loved what he was doing and all of those things. And so we backed into a plan patiently. He got his first start in December, obviously. We brought him through Saratoga through the prior summer. He, he needed to go and grow. At the farm, he was getting bored. He was gonna continue to do naughty things. And so, naughty boy things. And so we sent him to Saratoga with the idea. And I said to John, this will be a great experience for him. He can see so much and hear so much and do so much. Multiple race trucks, all the traffic, the people, the horses. And so he's like, I think it's a great idea. And that's what we did. So we were at Saratoga as a two-year-old, never intending to run. And then sent him to Gulf Stream, obviously his first start in December when he was second. I wanted to run two weeks earlier in a race that was a little bit longer. John didn't want to run yet. The blessing on that is he likely would have won that race because it was right before all the trainers came down. And then we would have likely had to have been staring at the whole Triple Crown conversation. And so we were actually, um, thank you, up there. You know, by him not winning that first race and then having a really rough trip the second start, um, it pushed us back a little bit where we never wanted to have the derby conversation because he was still so young and needed the time to mature and to grow up um, mentally and physically and all of those parts. So by whoever was been watching out on our journey, um, it pushed things back for us, thankfully, that that wasn't the conversation. And, and yes, we did take an unorthodox route, I'm aware. Um, I'm not, while I value the traditions of the sport, I am a non-traditionalist. So it, it works somehow. Um, so yes, broke our maiden, um, and then yes, leaving the horse in, in where we thought he was kind of cool. We'd always, he could always breeze quickly. And anyone that's been in this industry has heard this industry is the favorite term the trainer loves to hear, a morning glory. <laughs> For those of you that don't know what that means. <laughs> oh, this horse is breezing its eyeballs out. It's so talented, it's great. It's gonna run huge. Yes, we're ready to run. Did it finish yet? <laughs> it's slow in the afternoon. How did that happen? That's <laughs> all us. So you get, you know, your temper and expectations and excitement is going. Um, but watching how he broke his maiden for us uh, was the okay it means something to him. He got low, his stride got really long, he opened up in one of the fastest maiden races that year, and so then, um, yes, the big swing to New York, to Peter Pan, because who doesn't break their maiden in Florida going a mile and then go to a mile and eight stay race in New York? It's normal. Um, he did that well, and Javier gets on with him very well, obviously, and then um, who doesn't take the big swing and go to just a random grade one race at the Belmont Stakes? <laughs> First time going two turns. It'll be fine, it'll be fine. So we did that, that was a thing. Apparently that was a thing. Yeah, it wasn't just a great one, it was that great one. It sort of happened. My reaction apparently is kind of seen everywhere, I guess, so that was the thing. And then we, uh, you know, I guess non-traditionally again, went to the Travers thing. I guess there was a lot of chatter about that, how we got from there to there, but that's fine. And so for everyone that's gonna ask, I'll answer it. Our hope and our goal and our focus is obviously Breeders' Cup. And so it's just going to be letting him bring us there. But we have another breeze in Saratoga, and then he'll head out to um, California and get to work on his suntan for the next month. And hopefully, he agrees with our hopes of making it to the uh, to the classic. You took my next question. How dare you? That means we'll get a cute one. What's he like back at the barn? Explain his personality. Less naughty. <laughs> Thank God. Um, he's a really cool personality, um, and I do I do attribute that to what we did when we had him at the farm. Um, we gave him his space to be him and to figure him out for what made him tick. And you know, sometimes we'll see in any discipline, it doesn't matter if it's four horse world, thoroughbred world, saddle horse standard, you pick one. Sometimes um, when a horse has a big personality, people get intimidated by that. They'll yell at him, oh, stop it. You know, they'll shake and we're yelling, Argh. And so it's dancing on dance with some of those personalities. And with him, it was figuring out that um, he was just a big kid. You know, he was like, bing, 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 just a little like Zunder sometimes. We love John. Come on, focus. So, but that one, they did channel each other. They did find each other, I have no doubt. 
Um, and so sometimes with him, it's just getting him to um, focus. But the cool big shift we've seen in him now is when he's on the track and that saddle goes on him, when he's getting ready to head out, it is all business. It is, this is my work time. I'm not going to be a jerk. I'm going to, afterwards, after his gallop, he might be enough to Robert. Um, he yells at him, come on now, do you know better than that? Be it yourself, you know? And so it's very cute to watch them where you can almost see our banjo like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> open his buttons, you know, because Robert behave, be professional. It's very cute to watch them together, but um, he's a peppermint um, connoisseur. It's world of vaccine for a word. I had a very different word coming to mind. So connoisseur will be it. Um, he um, loves his massages and scratches, like, we put up a video not long ago of Poncho was scratching his back and waving him, and he was lift going, and he literally turns around like a dog and will push you against the wall to make sure you're getting in there where he wants you to do his stuff. But um, but business wise, you know, work wise, race wise, it is he gets it, which is something you really can't teach. They either have that or they don't. But in the barn, um, and if, I agree, exactly. <laughs> in the barn, and, and the, um, he gets a brown pen tie every day, um, which is more for our survival than his, um, because he gets his yaw yaws out and do his naughty things out there. He loves to roll after he trains and you know get a good balance for you know God's chiropractor out there. So it's a lot. He's a lot of personality. He, but he's also like 17 too. He's huge. Yeah, I know. No one realizes that. He's so leggy. Um, but yeah, we walk up next to him like, oh, you're so annoying. Okay. So he's, he's a, a, a tall kid. I'm so happy for him. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I have on my list of questions. We have a little time for just a couple of audience questions. If anyone has one, raise your hand. So from a racing perspective, we don't want to be a big barn. Yeah. You know, my, my commitment was to do this, was always to steward the best that I could with what we had. And so myself and Fiona and Robert and our team, we really enjoy the relationship with each horse and figuring them out and their personalities. And you know, we, we may not get to make all of them an Archangelo, but we want to enjoy the journey with each horse. And so our number at the track will stay probably right in that 30 number. Um, mm -hmm. and. And that's more from a, a racing cycle perspective. And so managing the business side of it with the horse love side, and, um, it, it's finding that balance um, of that. But it allows us to peel apart the, the ones that are really fancy that might need to travel a little bit to um, have their best opportunities for racing and allows you to kind of have a, a base. So that's how we back into that. And training-wise at the farm, um, you know, we're gonna be around 56-ish um, for breaking and training season. And um, you know, we have some mares and all that kind of stuff, but the ones that are the meat and potatoes. And then, did you say uh, you worked out of Walmart Farm? Goldmark. Goldmark in Ocala. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Mayor, the only one thing I want to say to you is God bless you and your team.
mentioned that you, your business wants to encourage the younger generation to enter the thoroughbred industry and honestly starting to follow you and everything, I've become a lot more interested in the thoroughbred industry um, and wanting to get into it at some point when I'm not 20. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, how do you encourage that and how do you find younger people who you think might be interested? That's a great question. And so I'm thrilled I didn't get into the thoroughbred industry when I was 20. I say it often, um, partially because I got to figure out who I was and this industry is so fast moving. Um, and it's so all-consuming, and then all of a sudden you're in just a little nucleus of people, and I've watched a lot of younger people, not just women, kind of lose their way a little bit because they just get part of the circus. Um, we often say that put the fences up to keep the people in, not the people out. Um, do that if you like. Um, but I think the biggest thing is to go and grow and figure out what really makes you happy and what makes you tick. And so there's a ton of business side of being in this industry. We always say the horses are the easy part. Um, I enjoy business, I enjoy figuring out how you can make money and how you can grow and how you can, and so I like the nuts and bolts of business. The horses is obviously passion and the easy part in my brain. And so it's finding that balance of what really makes you tick. And there's so many opportunities in this industry. It doesn't have to be just training horses seven days a week and having no life, like us. <laughs> a wonderful life. I know you got so confused, it's weird. It's like an auto. It is, it's auto correct. Well, they have an iPhone version that doesn't exist yet. Um, and so I think it's the biggest thing is people finding what makes them happy. And it may be working on the front side and, you know, running racing or figuring out, you know, maybe working at a racetrack or finding a social media company or marketing company. There's so many different exposures to the industry. Maybe a farm that does all rehabilitation work or a just does mares or sales work. So I think it's, it, I encourage anybody and everybody to keep exploring different avenues until you find what makes you tick. Selfishly, I went into racing because growing up as an athlete and a competitor and showing when I was doing mares and foaling and doing that, I missed competing because that was my thing. And so the racing happened for me a little bit organically because I wanted to bring it all together, full circle. Um, just to add on to that um, question really quickly is part of our reasoning for wanting to um, be able to open this up to the younger generation and to people that aren't necessarily in the industry already is because it is extremely hard or used to be harder trying to get it, you know, to expand now for somebody that hasn't grown up in the industry to to break that wall. And that's something, you know, Tiana has done all of our marketing for us and coming from an outside perspective, you know, how do we reach the masses and how do we make this very relatable and and approachable. And so I think that's been the biggest you know, thing with some of the younger generation that, you know, they've been bit by the bug, but only because they've seen it on TV, not because their uncle or their mom or, you know, any of it had, had a, an influence in the industry. And so I think it's, you know, be persistent on what you want, be persistent on what you're looking for, and don't be scared to, to get a no. Don't be scared to, you know, call up a big farm and say, I really want to do this, what can I do for you? And I think that's, you know, what our generation has to, you know, continue to do with an aspiring horse owner, it's my goal in 10 years, all female team and everything. Um, what advice would you give to someone like me? Because I did not grow up in the thoroughbred industry of going around with horses and all that. So I have the knowledge, but I need to connect the dots. So how can I do that? <laughs> We're all a little crazy. <laughs> yes, definitely check your sanity. If it's intact, don't do it. Um, <laughs> The one, and I have people, and I'll be curious to see how many people look at me sideways when I say this. I always encourage any new owner to be very fair with themselves financially. Do not own a horse that's gonna make you not live your lifestyle that you are comfortable with. Number one, I don't care if it's a thoroughbred or a pleasure horse, because it will become unfun is that a word? Yeah. Yeah. Instantly. Like every horse person, yeah, that's a word. <laughs> Absolutely, that's a word. And if it's not worth having it, equals horse ownership. Unfun. <laughs> but I think it's super important to be financially prepared in a way that it is, I, I liken horse ownership a little bit in, in, from an experiential perspective to um, owning, you know, 
sporting tickets, baseball, football, you know, it's an experience. You know if you're going to go buy football season tickets, it's going to cost you this much for the year, and you're going to have a great experience. And there's some of that to what we do. Again, loving horses and doing horses and all that is the easy part. If we're talking the other side of our brain, the business side, make, winning a race is, we all know the upside. Well, I'm going to go buy a horse, and it's going to win, and it'll be great. Yeah. I kind of wish it was. <laughs> My fiance wishes it was too, because he wouldn't have to hear owners. <laughs> so I think it's preparing yourself for the worst, hoping for the best, and being realistic to what the financial responsibility is so that you can enjoy what owning a horse and smelling the horses, not the manure, and being on the backside and all of those things and what that means. Yes, so I'm, I've been in the horse industry my whole life. I actually started out as a galloper in my 20s and fell in love with thoroughbreds. And fast forward 30 years and through a series of blessings, my husband and I own a farm in Texas. And my question is being overwhelmed. Because we do so many things there. We, we're standing there yeah. and we're folding mares. We just put in a training track. We've now got 150 horses and multiple employees. <laughs> into the tack room and I heard the door close behind me and I was like, <gasps> <laughs> so, um, so you don't always keep it together um, at all. Um, it's your table. <laughs> Honestly, it's your table. And to grow and to, I am coming. Yeah, you are so lovely. It's with the corgi. I'm a corgi. I have a corgi. you've got to let go of control. And it's, trust, it's very hard. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> and so it's, but that is the only way you grow in life and in this business is you put yourself around people that you know have your main focus. And it's okay if they get there a different way. Katie's a spreadsheet girl. <laughs> Loves her spreadsheets. I'm like, can we just do this way? This is my spreadsheet. Okay, you do your spreadsheets. Right here. <laughs> but, it's, but we get to the same end. Is that right, Mom? Yes. Nice long. She's like, oh, I have a great. Sometimes I just feel like we're chasing too many rabbits. But that's how you make it. This industry, if you can all live on one rabbit, that rabbit will and never count. And I will say, I was going to mention this earlier, um, Jenna and I have slowly built the, which sounds like, you know, as you guys have done, the, we started with one thing, and then once we, once our team was you know, confident enough in us as we were in them, <laughs> we we added something else and added something else. And and it is stressful. It's never not going to be You're dealing with animals. Um, but it's it's a being responsible in your growth and it's having the team that our team is is what allows us to take a week to come up here to Lexington and shop for our next group. If we didn't have that team at home, if she didn't have the team at the track, you know, we'd be glued to that and we wouldn't have any option and we, we wouldn't be growing. My husband tries to get fired every day. <laughs> <laughs> those are called yeah. voluntolds. <laughs> we have a lot of those. Spring night? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. focus has been, has always been for portal career for him. So God willing, and, and he deserves a lot of credit because obviously, um, yes, the doors are knocking, but he deserves a ton of credit for, for wanting to campaign this horse. So God willing, he stays healthy and well and thriving. 
Um, we do have a focus on a four-year-old career for him. I, I should apologize in advance for, or in retrospectively now, for my psychotic response down the stretch. So I'm always grateful, and I say this often, that they did a picture-in-picture picture of when I'm freaking out. So, yes, we, we are hopeful for a four-year-old career. So it, he'll be fine. Okay. Um, he'll be fine. Uh, there's actually, um, he likes to let us know daily. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of very good sires. Um, uh, honor code, AP and D, there is, there's several um, very, um, changing sires of our industry that were on um, one testicle courses. So he, he'll be fine. Just ask any man around here and they'll be fine. Okay? So as a, someone who transitioned from, like you, like from sport into thoroughbred ownership and breeding, I've noticed the dynamic between owners and trainers is so different in thoroughbred breeding. As an owner, I don't children with two legs, you wouldn't walk into a doctor's office blind and go, whatever you say, doc, good luck. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. And that's, that's been the big thing is that a lifetime horse person knows mm -hmm. enough, but then... Uh, it's okay to ask the questions, and if you're not getting the answers, yeah. then you need to assess that. And sometimes it's a simple conversation with ex-trainer. Hey, listen, I really enjoy this, I love what you're doing, but I don't want to feel like I'm disturbing you, or like I shouldn't be asking you this. I want to become... I want to learn more, and I want to understand where your point of view is on this, so please, can we have that conversation? And if their answer is no... It's, it's our job to meet you where you want to be. I appreciate that. And we have owners that are like, hey, just send me an update whenever, and I have others that are like... Yeah. I mean, our first moment about the training, and it's like, I'll be there every weekend driving five hours each way over two, the two minute, like, I'm going to be there. But you need help. <laughs> two-year-olds in the barn that um, on a, are on a similar path and trajectory as a um, ha-ha, not ha-ha, side note, um, one horse came in with the, well, next year is the 150th anniversary of the Derby. <laughs> we really hope this horse can make it because it's our anniversary too. Like, I like him no. <laughs> to know, the public deserve to know, and sometimes just crappy things happen. I'm the first time owner, and I need to leave the case. I'm actually sure exam soon, and I'm just making the transition from sport horse career. Mm -hmm.
commit to yourself, know who you are, and, and um, yes, talking about when bad things happen can be hard, but it, for me, it was always just walking into the, walking into it and just lean into it and embracing and, and understanding how how and what could we have done or what, if anything, and so as we all continue to navigate that right now in this industry, um, I find that transparency in that regard is absolutely paramount, and so that's why I always lean into the conversation.